Welcome to day. Welcome to the socket night play. Welcome to day. Welcome to the socket night play. Are we live now? Yeah, we're live. <laughs> That was, that, I was just getting into the Radiohead vibe, and then you turned the camera on. <sighs> Radiohead does not appear on camera, everyone. No, Negative. That's, that's Daft Punk. That's da That's right. <laughs> Wear our helmets. <laughs> Get us, Dom, I demand that we have matching helmets for the next episode of Disorganized Play. Okay. Get on that, chat. Chat. <clears throat> you know what the P.O. box is. Mm hmm Get it. Hey everyone, welcome. I'm Tom Lommel. I'm your co-host and dungeon master here at Disorganized Play. Dom Zook is our executive producer, 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 contributing producer, consulting producer, story editor, and personal assistant and co-host here for Disorganized mm -hmm. Play. True. Every Tuesday, such as it is, we get together and talk about the game that we're going to play every Wednesday, which is Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, Expedition of the Barrier Peaks. Every Thursday, we reconvene, generally in this space, and talk more about... How did that go? <laughs> um, so there. So there, take that. And it always goes well. Fight. Um, it always goes... Decently, but yeah. it always goes well. It does always go well. I always think to myself, that could have gone better. Sure. The classic... Such GM. is the curse yeah. of the being the dungeon master, right? right. Or like, <clears throat> this is also a, a curse of being an actor, is you go to a callback, and you go in the room, and you do the thing, and like all, you're in there for three minutes, and then it's over, and as you're walking out, you get into your car, and you go, oh, I know, you know what I should have done? Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh, you know, I could have tried, oh, oh. Mm-hmm. That, at that point, the job is just kind of out here in nebulous space, <clears throat> so. Welcome to uh, Dungeon Mastering. Welcome to Dungeon Mastering. It's just like acting. <laughs> Only your livelihood likely does not depend upon it. Hopefully not. Thank Hopefully God. Not. <laughs> Thank God. <clears throat> All right. Sewen Hellstrom, welcome to... Being an all-powerful garbage person. Well, they they're just checking their rank. They've yeah, been an all-powerful garbage checking person. Checking your rank. I mean, 1,344 points. A couple more dungeon delves, maybe you'll get lucky. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't. I didn't pull up my. I brought my laptop. I could have participated, but now it's, it's going to be an hour before the dungeon delve comes back around again. We yeah. won't be talking two hours today. It's not going to happen. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks to. Fakwad for uh, sitting in and modding as usual. <clears throat> um, so today we have a couple of ba pretty basic topics. Maybe we'll have some room to kind of kick the tires around, although I think we are going to need to talk about like how our timeline is tightening up. <clears throat> so let's take a look at what we've got on the board. Bam, bam, um, picking plot radar. That's the only, that's only, that's the noise for when you get rerolls. Beep, boop, 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 beep, boop, boop. Are you getting a reroll? No, uh, uh, the sound for when you get rerolls is what happens at Jeopardy when they start to do that. Yeah, the categories. Oh, they scramble the categories. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. It's a different sound. Okay. Completely. I'll different. take strategies for a condensed combat for four hundred, Alex. What is a condensed combat? <laughs> I, I gave you the answer. Yeah. You, no, you're supposed to give the answer, and then uh -huh. I say it in the form of a question. Right. I'll um, take strategies for a condensed combat for four hundred, Alex. The thing you do when you want to have a condensed combat. What is play Dungeons and Dragons in a cool way? <laughs> there is no cool way to play Dungeons and Dragons. Huh? <laughs> I disagree. <Come> on. <laughs> I disagree. Black Dragon BK. You're right. Destroyers of Worlds for 500 hours. 8K. 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 Yeah. There's like 8,000 of them. Um, Destroyers of Worlds for 500. I, I can't. You've got. This purple titan. Mm feeds on the essence of living biospheres. Uh, dark seed. <laughs> First of all, in the form of a question, Dom, have you watched the uh, show? I don't. Listen. Who is Galactus? After... Who is Galactus? Not a titan. Galactus is clearly a titan. He's like 80, 800 feet tall. He's huge. He's a celestial. Thank you, modern chow. He's a celestial. Thank you. Thank you. You and me, Chad. 
All right. <laughs> I'm demoting you from co-host to junior co-host. <laughs> if you're talking about a purple titan, I think you might be talking about Thanos. <laughs> Who's the mad titan? Purple. Also not a titan. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Vin Diesel and Joe Mangianello play Dungeons and Dragons. There's a cool way to play. Mm, 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 mm. Modern Chow, don't turn on me like this. Thank you, guys. Just because Thank Thanos you. is from Titan doesn't mean he is a Titan. He is the Mad Titan. titan. He is the Mad t. Titan. Small T. <laughs> Small T Titan. <sighs> Luigi, you're still my friend, right? As long <laughs> as I've got these. Yeah. Which are... Quickly running Rapidly out. Rapidly, <laughs> I got a large one too. This is like Garbage appeasing dog. a velociraptor. Yeah, <clears throat> that's right. He's not happy until he takes your arm off. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Okay. So uh, let's get into the meat and the mix. We've got a lot um, to pack into. We've got four sessions left, right? Uh, including this week, right? So, so there's this Wednesday, and then there's three more to get everything. We're going to kind of try and put a bow on this whole adventure arc in uh, the next four sessions. So. That is, um, that's, that, that's a tall order, but I think we can get there. Let's mm -hmm. take a look at our plot radar. Good news, everyone. I have already filled in the plot radar so we can talk through it rather than sit here and like watch me scratch my head and think of things that you've already seen. So I don't know if you want to flip over to the larger view sure. to make them happy. Four sessions to hold up for a TPK. You know, if we have a TPK this week, We've got three weeks to kind of do whatever we want. It's true. Yeah. Vacation time. Vacation. All right. So uh, if we look, I, I kind of went through and just revised plot radar based off of what happened last session. Last session was a big kind of info dump, um, and and we did change several things, um, or resolve things in certain directions. Right. Uh, last week, as a result of their encounter with the doppelgangers, the ghost children. I don't think the party is necessarily aware of just how much power the doppelgangers have, because uh, it, at least in my envision of it, um, Estel Castillo, I see <laughs> you. <clears throat> um, in my vision of it, the doppelgangers have actually hacked into the computer systems of the ship and have, like, that's one of the reasons that the bots can't see them, mm -hmm. is they've made it like, oh, if it doesn't have some sort of DNA pattern, just ignore it. Yeah, They're like it's a, it's they've they've hacked in a deliberate blind spot, and they've hacked uh, into the systems monitoring things. That's why they know that the the engine is on overload and whatnot, right? So they know the doppelgangers know a lot of a lot of stuff, and they can kind of like manipulate parts of the ship. But I don't think the party latched onto that idea at all. I don't think they asked any follow up questions or or really like ha demonstrated that they had under any understanding that that the doppelgangers had as much mastery or were as in tune with the ship as as I think that they are. Sure. Right? And that's always that's always an issue is like you as the DM, you have this conception of how a situation is, and you give some hints out about what's going on, but you don't want to be so obvious that you just sort of like lay all your cards on the table. So you give some hints about what's going on and try and let the party draw their own conclusions and then the party never latches on to it. <laughs> right. Either never latches on to the conclusions or doesn't put the pieces together in, in the right way. There they go, oh, oh, oh wow, well how do they know all this stuff? Mm -hmm. Maybe the answer was obvious like somehow that you know, because they were manipulating the, you know, it might have been, as we talked about last week, that the party was trying to be a little too meta, where it's like, well, we don't know what that guy at that console is doing when he's playing the silent piano, so we're going to pretend that we don't know that they've hacked the ship. Right. We don't know what hacking is. Which is fair. Like, it's, it's fair for them to play that way. Um, okay. That's, that's just the way that it, that, that, that is. Mm -hmm. But let's take a look. Let's kind of, like, go through our scope of work document and look at where things have landed here on the page, right? So I, I decided to sort of retire the curse, right? I feel like the, I just felt like in the moment, the doppelgangers have a way to dissolve or neutralize isolated pieces of the curse, right? Like I think they probably like, the, the silver curse is this gas that gets jetted throughout the ship 
um, that eats flesh, and I think they just retreat to their portion of the ship that's airlocked, and they wait for the dust, literally the dust to settle, mm -hmm. and then they go back out in the ship if they need to, right? Um, but I think they must have a way of treating this stuff, and I kind of envision it as some sort of like flesh-eating nanite type of stuff. But they must have some, I just decided in the moment, like, okay, you know what, they can treat this. We've got so many balls in the air that we're already juggling that to have the curse be a major um, plot element just seems like it's, it's loading up the party a little too much. It kind of doesn't matter because they still have the issue of, well, we need to regenerate, you know, Tobias and we need to regenerate um, Abigail's leg, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, are, uh -oh. are you being a, a powerful young man? Are you going to lay down again in the hopes that you get a French fry? Or are you just going to go to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> It, Lay down. This is fascinating, you guys. Yeah, fascinating TV. Sorry. Hey. Oh, he wants some. He wants some gin. He, yeah. Well, get his, can he have some bourbon? Do you blame him? There. Yeah. It's bullet. <laughs> Good times. Um, so uh, they, they, you know, we've we've sort of removed one emergency, as it were. Although I think this could come back out of retirement, right? Like I think Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian's threat is he's going to like jet this stuff throughout the ship mm -hmm. once he kind of catches on to what's going on, right? Yeah. So it's still sort of there and it's still a problem. It's just not the go find three MacGuffins and create an antidote type of um, a threat that it may have been if it had been introduced earlier or we didn't have a bunch of other stuff going on, right? The key cards are retired. The tech of pygmies and veggie pygmies are retired. Those, those things are all good, right? Um, so things that we're going to try and deal with immediately in, in this next session. We need to find a way for Tobias to be regenerated, right? Like the, 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 the immediate issue facing the party is that Tobias has sort of been vivisected by the droids uh, in the first hell. I'd probably put that as retired too, for the most part. Um, <clears throat> so, so we need to find a way to like save his life. That's 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 on the docket. I don't know that we will save his life in this next session, mm -hmm. but they need to kind of go. Okay, this is our this is how we're going to try and do it, or whatever whatever that means. <clears throat> um, Likewise, I think we need to start circling into this whole Basharla's vessel thing, right? <laughs> I don't think we have enough cameras for Luigi Cam. I don't know. Maybe, I suppose, if we wanted to move one of our streaming ones, that's more your call. Yeah. No, uh, it's a little bit more of a pain in the, the butt than setting up the pug one for, for Harold. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can, I can move the table cam so that it's not longer a table cam. Oh, that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dirty. <clears throat> All right, so um, so I think we need to start. We need to start focusing either in this next session, either in this next session or in the session after, about this whole quest that Ava has for finding a vessel for Basharla. And the question is, clearly Basharla is an entity that is in the ship somewhere, right? Like she is the only god or goddess that's available to commune with right now, although the ship does seem to be steeped in divine divine energy. Um, so that, that that's sort of tied into the question of like where is Basharla? Who is she like what who is she? What's like what's her deal? What's her deal? <laughs> so those two things in my mind are sort of like tied together, right? We need to we need to get we need to get into the meat of encountering either some way for Basharla to form a, 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 a vessel that, that is apparently mobile, right? Mm -hmm. like, or or can, that she can use to escape the ship. Um, or we need to just encounter her personally and figure out like what her deal is. Is recovering Tobias a must? What would happen if they fail to recover Tobias? You know, so, so, so the, the, that has been put on the table in terms of a solution, is that you could put Tobias inside of an owl, right? Right, yeah. Like, that was offered to them. 
So, is it a must that they succeed at it? No. Do I feel like we need to offer them the opportunity to complete some sort of you know, quest or overcome some sort of thing or whatever and have the capability of saving him as he is? I think yes, right? Otherwise, otherwise it feels like a, like a cheap shot or a misdirection to say, why don't you go find the tech? There might be some technology down in Earth world that will regenerate Tobias, right? Why don't you go find that? And then it, it turns out it's not there. It doesn't work. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Well, we're just going to have to put him inside this owl. Well, to me, that's, dis that's a disappointing outcome, and it feels like you're jerking the players around. And also, it's not a great solution because then how do we get him out, right? Is, is the implication then you could take this thing and then go to like a cleric and have his soul removed from it and have him be reincarnated or something? Like, I don't know. I, yeah. You know, in, in my reading of the intersection between magic and technology, they're just separate enough that if you were to transfer him into this thing, I don't think they would know how to get him out. Right, like I think they would have. I think if you put him into a technological magic jar, you have to use technology to reform his body to resurrect him. If they were to, if they were to somehow like, what if Grayson could somehow imprint on somebody and like become that guy, or one of the doppelganger clones could do that, right? Mm -hmm. Then he becomes that guy, and I, I think that would be an interesting way. Like you could take him out of the ship and then maybe cast some sort of magic on that person right. to maybe separate the entities out or something like that. But um, I, I, I don't, I think, I think the thing is, so, so to get at more of the heart of your question, is there an option for failure here? I've already taken the option for failure off the table by offering them the owls, right? So failure has been taken off the table, right? That's, that's that thing. That's, that's the deal there. Um, He's going to he's going to be saved somehow, even if it's just some sort of sad like <clears throat> he's trapped in this technological weird container jar thing or uh -huh. what have you. Um, so there's that. But I think we need to somehow get um, we need to somehow get them to have some sort of plan. Like okay, we could use this to save Tobias, right? Mm -hmm. Especially because this quest has sort of come up like last minute. Let's not make it a big drawn out affair like, like let's let's address it head on so i think that's why that's in, you know immediate in the next session um <clears throat> we talked about basharla i think the froggy moth needs to make some sort of appearance is it going to be a fight with the froggy moth i don't know <clears throat> that seems fun mm -hmm. but i, I don't want to have a ton of combats so right we're going to talk about that later here today in disorganized play but I, you know, it, it, is, it is an iconic encounter, so I think it should probably happen. Mm -hmm. Where or how, I'm, I, I, I still have to make, make up my mind about that, right? <clears throat> um, and then coming up, I don't know if this is the next, the next session in terms of uh, dealing with this, but I think we need to set up a journey into the two hells, right? We've been talking about this whole cosmology of the ship, and I think we need to pay that off by having them, you know, the answer to something is down in the two hells. Probably the God's Fire, right? Which is over here. Mm -hmm. um, but the answer to something is in the two hells. We need to, need to send them on their way there. And to be clear, one of the hells can be loosely modeled off of tween deck, which is deck four. But obviously, the 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 other hell, the third hell, is not going to be the the third deck of the ship with the weird, enter, you know, entertainment room and the it's theater the gym and, all and, all gym yeah. and all that kind of garbage, right? Um, I think we could have we can steal some of those elements: the mind flayer, the intellect devourers. Um, the I don't know about the she do I don't know if they'll be down there but we can steal some of the, some of that stuff and mm -hmm. and re remix and reincorporate it 
into the two hells. But I think we need to at least start setting this up in this next session, because we got three, right? Now, one of them, some of the stuff I feel like I could move into the distant column, right? Like Xanathar, I think, could probably go into the distant column. The time dilation thing could probably, you know, that's dangling right now. It could I, I initially put it in this distant column. Those things could live there. Thon's father could probably live in the distant column. These things sort of, you know, we've only got four sessions left, so it's like, where exactly do they live? It's unclear. Today is the 27th. Um, Ooh, you did an interesting thing here. Oh, whoops. <laughs> That's the European version. <laughs> yeah. Um, escaping the ship, I think, is going to happen to happen before Xanathar and Thon's father get get downloaded. All this other stuff, I think, lives in the approaching column, right? But these are two elements that it's questionable. I think these are probably like the final session elements, right? Yeah. Those are session four. So I think they could probably like fairly safely live out there. But then session session two and three, we're definitely going to have to deal with the God's Fire, Grayson's Vision, Sebastian's Threat, the Info Stream Reconnection, Reactor Overload, ex Escaping the Ship. And I think these owls play in here some, somewhere in here too, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> um, so that's kind of looking at, like, that's the shape of the um, thing. Griffin, uh, Griffin of H says, maybe the froggy moth can work more as a color element and initiate another combat with a different foe or perhaps a chase sequence of some sort. I really like the idea that there's a chase sequence. I really, I think that's a cool thing. I don't, you know, the trick, the trick on a chase sequence is the players have to have a reason to run, mm -hmm. right? Now, in my experience, parties don't run away from monsters. Even if you like put giant minis on the table and you go, oh yeah, there's this guy and then there's like four other dudes. Parties, so one person in the party will say, no, we're not chickening out. We're not gonna run away from this thing. Yeah. I will stand and fight and then in order to you know keep the entire game experience going, the rest of the table will stick with them, and then what you thought was going to be like a clear like, oh okay, well this is going to turn into a running chase thing where they just sort of like shoot arrows and throw javelins at them, right? Um, instead, turns up to a stand up fight that they're not prepared for, that they they just get the crap walloped on them, and by the time that they think to start running away, they're already so low on hit points that that party members start getting taken down. And then you're like, well, you guys decided to stay and fight. Mm -hmm. And half the group is like, I didn't want to stay, but then a one dude, you know, and it just causes a lot of dissension because either they feel like you set off a bad encounter. An unwinnable. You know, yeah, an unwinnable. Right. Well, like, why, well, why would you even put that in there if there wasn't a way to win it? Well, I, you know, sometimes I play tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like, like w were we even supposed to take on that thing? Well, you weren't supposed to, but you did. Well, you know. It, it, it gets into this whole argument of uh, like, why are you DMing this way? And you don't really ever want to get into an argument of why are you DMing this way? Right. You're instantly on the defensive and it causes a bad personal dynamic between you and the players. Um, Griffin of H has a good idea, uh, perhaps uh, run away from an environmental disaster or threat, and then you pair that with the froggy moth and you know, it gets even more interesting, right? So for instance, if we had the reactor overload, like, you need to get X distance away from this thing before it short circuits or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, and while this is happening, the froggy moth pops up and starts chasing you as well, right? The problem with that is, in this particular case, the froggy moth doesn't really have ranged attacks, mm -hmm. right? The froggy moth is definitely a grapple, swallow, cut your way out kind of monster. And that's... Um, that's a little tricky, right? Like that, that doesn't make for a great chase sequence because then everybody has to like stop, come back, and you waste a lot of time going, well, actually you're 75 feet away and so you can't throw your dagger unless you throw it at disadvantage. 
And they're like, oh, okay, so wait a minute, can I double move? No, that's with your double move that you're 75 feet. Can I use my bonus action to do No, you're not a rogue, unless there's no rogue going. Okay, so, but isn't there, uh, 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 you know what I mean? <clears throat> so in this particular case, I would say it would be more interesting if it, you know, had some sort of ranged attack where it slung darts at you or mm -hmm. um, maybe it used some sort of ability to slow you down in terms of like it, it, it ate away at your speed or something like that. That would be fine. Like, I, I also just, you know, love the idea that maybe their job is just to stay ahead of this thing and navigate other um, environmental uh obstacles around them sort of like we had like a reverse chase scene that we had in Waterdeep remember mm -hmm. we were chasing after a guy in this case maybe you're running away from and it's like you always want to stay at least 15 feet ahead of this thing and on your way out you need to jump over the pipe or you right. need to dive through the boiling vapor spray or whatever it yeah. is right so it could be a fun reverse chase from the frog he moth um, I'm gonna write down reverse chase. <clears throat> um, yeah, so th those, are, those are solid ideas. I think, I think you have to look at what design elements are you going to put in play and what sort of traps do the players tend to, like style of play type of traps do the players fall into when they, um, when they, when they, when they do this, you know, when, when you set up a, a, a chase sequence like this. So, yeah, things things collapse, etc. Richard McSundy says, I had a similar situation in Curse of Strahd, and at some point, after hinting with the flavor at the imminent defeat that they would face, I just let the smart character roll intelligence and told her that they were going to die. <laughs> Honestly, like, that's one of my biggest problems with Curse of Strahd is they have many different opportunities to actually directly encounter Strahd. And I don't think Strahd has very many reasons not to annihilate the party once the party is like ninth level. Mm -hmm. Like you can kind of go, oh, well, they're fifth level. Let's just toy with them. They're sixth or seventh level. They're not really a threat, but he has to be either profoundly arrogant or profoundly stupid when they go visit the Amber Temple or whatever it is and they retrieve X item or relic or whatever it is, that's a key to his defeat. For him not to go, why don't I send just wave after wave of demon wolves after these guys, wear them out, and then I'll show up and kill four of them and take the sword away. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it is a very, it's a very difficult, like, like I can get from the DM's point of view how you go, well, yeah, that's his hubris. That's, that's that's the whole shtick, right? But for me, as sitting on the player side of the table, I go, yeah, but why doesn't he kill us? Mm -hmm. Because if I was playing, if I was if I was in his position as a player, and I could teleport X number of times a day, and I could literally control an entire demi plane, I would f these guys, yeah. <laughs> you know. So so I just drop the hammer on them so hard, <clears throat> um, and I get that he's bored. But I think you have to. I think you have to make some accommodations in that adventure to enable player suspension of disbelief to keep on functioning once they um, keep powering up. So I don't want to talk in depth about Curse of Strahd, but but it's it's that's a different show. It's difficult, right? <clears throat> so um, anyway, so that's that. I like the idea of a reverse chase, and I don't know if the Froggy Moth is definitely like that's the way. I'll probably use Volo's Guide Froggy Moth. It's a, it's a level 10 creature, and I don't think, um, I don't think it's worth homebrewing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, take, I, take with what's given to yeah, you. Yeah, I, I think it's, I think, I think if anything, uh, uh, I may, adjust it so maybe it does have a little bit of a ranged attack or something like that, but I, I don't know. It has that weird like belch spawn kind of thing. Um, it, it seems pretty tough and it's legitimately supposed to be tough. So uh, that's that's fine. Um, I th is it in Volo's Guide? Yeah, it's in Volo's Guide. I think it's earlier F for Froggy Moth. 
Is it a type of hag? Uh, froggy moth? No, but I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> hag ideas. <clears throat> so, um... 145. That, that's our little roadmap of where we're going over the next four sessions. So, next session we need to deal with the Earth deck and we need to reveal some things. Oh, spoilers for everybody who... Look at that. Oh, well, it's so tiny nobody can read it, yeah. right? It's got a lot of hit points is the thing, right? Mm-hmm. And it hits hard. Plus 10 to attack, 3d8 plus 6 bludgeoning damage, and grappled. Makes three attacks. Yeah. Two. Well, it's only two with its tentacles and one with its bite, right? Yeah. What's the big deal? So, uh, yeah, it's pretty rough. It's a it's a pretty rough creature. I, I think it is one of those iconic, like, it is, it gets a full-page spread in the adventure, right, mm -hmm. and in the illustration book. So I don't think we can write it out. But let's talk about this next session. Where we left off was they're coming down the lift, and these weird plant creatures get up and start shambling toward the sound of the lift as it descends, mm -hmm. right? Now, this sort of, this whole topic brings us to strategies for a condensed combat, right? Because there are two opportunities for combat here. One is obviously the froggy moth, if we want. Um, but the other more immediate one are all of these weird like shambling creatures, whether they're shambling mounds or whatever they are, hard to say. Um, that are coming toward the um, toward the party. Now, I thought about turning this combat into more of a role playing encounter, right? Okay. Like if if you sit there and you ask yourself a couple of core questions of how can we make this combat interesting, and then what can we reveal with this combat? I don't know what the answer are, is for these weird shambling plant creatures, these shambling mounds that are coming toward the party, right? And if you don't know the answer, then you're looking at potentially a fairly boring fight. Like what is interesting about the situation that they find themselves in? Well, they could theoretically like stop the lift before, they... before it gets to the bottom and then just attack these things and drive them off, right? That's that's potential. I don't know whether they'll do that or not. I don't know if they'll remember that they'll contr they control the lift. Some of that depends upon how I set the scene back up, right? If I say, you know, okay, so Avril pushed this thing and it started to move and everybody else jumped on and as she presses her foot down on it, the platform continues to descend, right. then the party might have the idea, oh, well, I can take my foot off or hit something else and it'll do something else, yeah. right? So some of it, you can kind of put that thought, you know, into the atmosphere of the table with the way that you recap things. Um, so that's one way that this encounter could essentially be short-circuited is that are they dumb enough to sit around and just take missile fire from above until everybody's dead? No, they're going to run away, right? So that would be one way to, sh to shorten this thing up. Could also just turn it into a role playing encounter. If you don't have an interesting idea of how this combat plays out, and it really just turns into slugfest of slugfest, hit points versus hit points, why not either find a way to eliminate it or turn it into an RP encounter that can reveal more information about the things that you have on your sheet, right? The, the secrets that you're holding on to that enable you to, to move the plot forward or enable the players to pick them up and move the plot forward, right? So keep that in mind. That's one way that I, you know, I think I'm trying to do a better job of, be, of DMing, which is the fights are interesting, but you can kind of check out during a fight until it gets to the climactic resolution. Every mm -hmm. once in a while, it's punctuated by somebody rolling a natural 20, mm -hmm. but I don't think that there's a lot of back and forth in a D&D combat, right? If, if you look at Dungeon World, for instance, whenever the players roll too low, something exciting happens and a complication is introduced, right? In D&D, when the players roll too low, Nothing, Nothing happens. happens. Yeah. There's no complication that's introduced. So the, the the tone of your fight really is just sort of this war of attrition of like grinding down hit points, grinding down hit points, and whoever gets to zero first um, saves the day. Now, you, 
as I've said, you can have your um, you can have your NPCs surrender. I talked about this on Thursday, right? Where they want to live just as much as anybody in the party wants to live, although party members off, often also fight down to one hit point, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> it's 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 one of the iconic attributes of D&D, but I think it's also one of the dramatic story problems of D&D is that everything's great until you're at zero hit points. And at one hit point, everything's great. But when you get to zero hit points, everything is wiped out, right? And so players tend to play this game of, I'm not getting debilitated. I just only have a few more hit points left. And don't worry, the cleric's going to heal me on their round anyhow. And then the mm. cleric goes, I flame strike that guy. And you're looking at him like, well, wait a minute. You're supposed yeah. to heal me. Whack, you get smashed in the face, and now you're down and out, right? And the DM is like, you only had three hit points. Why didn't you disengage? <laughs> I thought I could take him. I thought I could take it. So, so having, your, um, having your NPCs decide to surrender is a proactive move that you as the DM can take that maybe is a little bit off the beaten path of the play style that your players are going to pursue. Your players don't have an incentive to surrender when they have five hit points. They have incentive to like try and kill this guy off because they don't know how many more hit points he has. Maybe I can crit. Yeah. You know, the hope for a crit springs eternal. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing. I think, too, it's, it's all right to... I think monsters in 5e, much less so than in 4e, but still to a certain extent have a ton of hit points, right? If you want to if you want to make a fight fairly tough, you kind of like you don't have to boost the hit points of most creatures by much, right? For anything that's that's level appropriate. Now, this guy's CR10 is he level level appropriate for the party? Still probably with bumps and everything like that. The the party punches above its yeah. weight and they have two artifacts in the party and, you know, whatnot. Right. So 184 hit points sounds like a lot. I think you know, in the right situation, they could probably crank him out in three rounds. They should be able to do 60 hit points a round for sure. Between the four of them? I would You'd think. think. I would think. Yeah. Um, assuming, you know, somebody doesn't get eaten, but that monster is built around somebody getting eaten. So you could shave some hit points down and then have them hit a little bit harder up front, right? Really, and, and, and I think the other, the other flourish that you put on top of that is have, have the monster open up with some sort of power that requires a recharge, or maybe it only recharges on a six or something like that. So it's not going to be able to lay out, like, if it has this weird tadpole spawn breath that does, you know, six die eight worth of damage. Gross. Yeah, it's super gross, <laughs> but it's also part of the monster, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, have that recharge on a six, have it open up with that, do a pile of damage to somebody, and then and then its tactics start to turn more to, okay, well, I'm going to pick a guy off or whatever. Right. Um, and that way you can kind of condense that whole combat into this big kind of upfront hard-hitting moment that then rapidly begins to tail off. But everybody's like... Everybody's ears are pricked up, and especially if you're rolling for a recharge every round, mm -hmm. that adds a lot of drama to that combat. Even if they just finish it off in three rounds, yeah. having knowing that, you know, like, oh, okay, well, let's see if his breath weapon recharges, and you roll the dice. The, the trap there is maybe the breath weapon recharges again, and you hit him again with another six die eight worth of damage, right? That's the risk you're running. You can also always modify those rules. Okay, this is an extraordinary ability. It recharges re recharge on a 12, on a 12 die 6 or whatever. Mm -hmm. The dice can still be fluky. That's part of playing the game. <laughs> the dice are fluky. I, I also wouldn't necessarily like, like... You're also well within your rights to say it doesn't recharge and it's just a once per day kind of thing and he opens mm -hmm. up with his big laser shot and that's that. So... Uh, but I would recommend putting your heavy punches up front and giving the monster a shorter lifespan rather than doing kind of a slow burn or a rolling thunder yeah. kind of thing where mm -hmm. a few things show up and then a few more things show up and the big bad shows up. And kind of, if that's your set piece combat, great. Good. It, it enables you to bleed off a bunch of spells and abilities that the players would have 
against the minions and the lesser lieutenants. And then the big bad comes out and he really starts wreaking havoc. But that's your whole session, right? Right. You know, Xanathar is not going to be like, in the Niners is going to pop up and then start attacking and hit with two really strong eye beams attacks and then go down, right? You're going to expect him to be smart, deploy minions, da 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 But also, you expect that that's going to be most of that session. With, with where we are, as only four episodes until the season finale, yeah, and all the things that they're trying to do, mm -hmm. like introducing a froggy moth battle just seems like... Uh, superfluous, you know, yeah. like unless it is teaching them something, like like he's dr driving them to go a direction or something like that mm -hmm. by chasing them. Like you right. were saying, like making it more of an RP uh, combat than a rolling combat necessarily right. would um, that would make sense. But if it's other, if it's just a combat combat for combat's sake, it that. We're, you know, we're taking time out of what they could be, you know, all of these things that they could be doing to fight something they have no connection to whatsoever. But, you know, yeah, it's, I, it's I, an integral part of the original module, but it's not necessarily a uh, thing that's featured in the story, as it were. Well, and, and I, I think, you know, my, my original point of, like, find a way to turn this into some sort of RP encounter mm -hmm. that reveals something. And when I say RP encounter, I don't necessarily mean a role-playing encounter in the, in the traditional sense. Like, are they going to talk to the Frogamoth? Not necessarily. No, probably not, right? But role-play in terms of we are interacting with this creature and it is responding some way in which we learn something, mm -hmm. right? So even if it's something as simple as, well, if we feed it, you know, if, if we find a way to, f to leave a trail of fish that it follows and can lead it away from its lair and we can get into its nest, that's a role-playing encounter, right, mm -hmm. in my mind, or at least a, a sort of uh, a, a diffusing a trap type of encounter. That's not a combat encounter, which is much more compelling, but also um, requires fewer die rolls and mm -hmm. not as kind of like march, march, march complicated um, down the line as a straight up roll for initiative and let's, 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 let's fight hit points. Right. You could have him essentially guarding something here, you know, the right. info stream or, or something like that that they need to get to. And if they have like a doppelganger with them to be like, Oh yeah, that dude. That's the you know that's the froggy moth, and you you don't stand a chance against him. We need to figure out another way to get him out of there, you know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. That might help, mm -hmm. you know, keep keep them on on task, but also let them engage. And if it turns into a combat, it turns into a combat. But at least right. at the end, they have accomplished a thing that they need to accomplish, rather than you know. I think part of. I think part of the key to having a condensed combat, right, is to, and I hate to say this because it sounds so kind of like cheesy and cliche actor talk, but <laughs> like have the monster have some sort of goal or motivation that it's deeply tied to, right? Mm -hmm. And it feels like sort of a video game shortcut of like, oh, it's, it's guarding the eggs, so if we harm the eggs, it's going to, you know come after us or it's going to like retreat to its lair or whatever it is, right? Right. But that is a plausible way to give the monster some definition and meaning ap apart from it just being this hulking pile of stats that yeah. is coming to whip hit points off of you. Right. Right. And and, and in that respect, it, it goes from being a combat encounter of who can fight the hardest to being more of a puzzle solving encounter of how can I take the knowledge of what I know about this creature and apply it to the situation or apply tactics to the situation in a way that I can manipulate this monster, right. Right? right? And so when I talk about turning it into an RP encounter, I'm really talking about manipulating the behavior of the monster mm -hmm. uh, in the way that you know the, the party is, is interested in or engaged with, right? Yeah. The, the party manipulating the, the, the behavior of the monster and in order to do that, you need to describe this monster with some sort of attachment to the world that they understand, right? Or they can at least suss out. 
Yeah. You know, even if it's give me a survival check or a knowledge nature check or a perception check or whatever, you see that there's this weird nest of like logs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You know, and I guarantee you, like if that happens, Avril is like, I'm gonna sneak around over there. Yeah. Okay. Which makes the players feel cool. It makes them feel competent. It makes them feel like they avoided a big, nasty, ugly fight. They saved some resources and hit points, saved some time, and they actually came up with a plan and executed it in a, you know, in a competent fashion. And players like, they, the players want their PCs to be heroes mm -hmm. a lot of the time, right? It, they can be flawed heroes and they can be heroes that fail in interesting ways, but they don't want their heroes to be boring is the, is right. the long and the short of it. I, I like giving players the option you know, it's, yeah, if you want to just go in guns blazing and try and take this thing down, that's your prerogative, but... And a lot of players, like, that's... It's, you know, especially when you're not in a streamed game, when you're just sitting at the table, that's the obvious answer, and some players don't want, like, either they don't want to put the thought into it, or they don't want to sit there while the other five people at the table kind of go, go round and round, and cir yeah, circularly yeah. bat these things back and forth and one person is entrenched like no this is the way that we have to do it and somebody yeah. else is like that's a really dumb idea and somebody else will just say you know what I draw my sword I shoot my bow whatever it is right. they'll short circuit the entire argument yeah because yep. because the play experience is not engaging for them right whether that's proper behavior or you know a, like a cool move to pull off or not that's a diff that's a whole different discussion, <laughs> but it happens is what I'm getting. That's at. for our curse of Strad talk. That's, yeah, we'll save that for Strad talk. Thursday's Strad talk. Strad talk. T tune in. Tune in. Strad talk. Tune in. Join us in the demi plane of shadows. <laughs> Wait, no, he lives in the. Um, that was sort of a Xanathar laugh. Demi demi plane of dread. Where does he live? I thought it was. Demi he lives plane in the of mists. Shadows. Join us in the demi plane of mists. Um, does he live with Galactus? Purple Titan? No, he lives with he lives with Thanos because he's part of the DC universe. Oh no! <laughs> <clears throat> so I, I think those are some those are some so there's some mechanical tips there in terms of like condensing the combat. Um, there are also um, some design tips that you need to consider. That I think I, I would argue you should probably consider those for almost every monster. You know, if we're gonna have a big brawl like final kind of like end game kind of uh season finale battle with xanathar then let's give the party some levers that they can manipulate the situation to their advantage whether it's something that xanathar is tied to that mm -hmm. he's you know very um <laughs> that he's very motivated to protect or to attack or whatever it is um fine but you know players like having Players like having levers that they can manipulate against an opponent. Mm -hmm. So so regardless of whether you want to have a really short combat or not, you should always be thinking of like what sort of personality and personal goals and motivations can I apply to this monster to make them living, breathing, three-dimensional and 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 make the players understand if you were to do a persuasion check or you were to threaten a certain thing or you were to intimidate somebody or, or whatever it would have an effect in the balance of what's going on yeah yeah um so those are those are really sort of like the two main features i think also like like maybe the basic point here is like if there's not a strong reason to fight or to keep fighting why mm -hmm. and and as i look at this shambling mound kind of thing. One of the reasons that I think it needs to kind of begin as a combat style encounter is the last thing the party learned about Earth is that it's very hostile to flesh-based life, right? The doppelgangers are like, meat gets, is, is hunted down there. It's a precious commodity and any creature made of flesh gets hunted. Well, you can't have that be like the last thing that they learned before they went onto this level and then have the shambling mounds go, hello, friend, welcome yeah. to our realm of Earth, da 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 da, da right? right. Um, so it needs to be a hostile encounter, but how long it needs to be a hostile encounter is a question you should always ask yourself. At what point 
Could this thing flip from these guys being hostile to them changing their mind or having a moment of doubt or thinking, you know what, we're outmatched, let's retreat. Right. And all of those outcomes have kind of different implications for how much information that the players get. But sometimes just driving off a threat, like you've driven them off, but they're going to be back. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now, now all of a sudden we've sort of set a clock on the party. Yeah. Of like, well, you can hang out here and you'll be fine for a little bit, but they're regrouping and they're probably marshalling more forces and they're going to come back with even more of their friends. And as a GM, you always have 100% control over that. You can, you can always say, okay, I know he's got 100 hit points, but actually I'm just going to cut him off. Right, you know? right. And, and they do, World of Warcraft does this all the time with, with raids and stuff like that, where once you hit 50% hit points, the boss changes tactics and so, you know, does, runs away, and then a bunch of minions come in and, and attack. And then once you get them out, then the boss comes back, and once you get him down to 25%, then he changes tactics again, and it's an all-out thing. You know? So it's like you can always change and adjust yeah. how you're running your combat in order to fit what you want to do. If you're like, well, this combat's taking an hour and a half, and I really just want us to get on, okay, I'm just going to... I'm just going to say that these guys are going to run away at this point. And they might come back later if the party doesn't go after them. If the party goes after them, then, okay, that's what they want to do, and we'll, we'll finish this to its logical con conclusion. But, you know, you have that ability to, to play with the, the structure of, of every encounter, really, um, and, and adjust it to where you need it to be. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we... I think we talked about this a few episodes ago, mm -hmm. where we talked about, like, considering for each encounter what is the best possible outcome for the party, what's a mixed result, and what would constitute a failure, yeah. right? And, and to have a couple options f for each of those, mm -hmm. really, right? Ideally, or, or at least some ideas, like, okay, the best possible outcome here is they drive those things off and they never come back. Right. Arguably, still a best possible outcome is they drive them back, but they know that they might come back later and attack in greater numbers. Is that really a mixed result? <laughs> a little bit, but not not necessarily. Right. You know? Um, I, th I think, you know, a, a mixed result in my mind would be they, they drive them off, but the guys sabotage the lift so that it's no longer useful, right? Mm -hmm. They wreck the lift and they can't get back up to that level immediately. That's kind of a mixed result. Yeah. I don't know. Um, just, just to have those possibilities in mind before you go into the combat encounter so that, that in the midst of, uh, as all of this is unfolding, you can go, oh, well, this is really leading towards something bad happening. This is not leading towards something good happening right. or whatever. Yeah. And, and that way you have some ideas when you see the opportunities that, and they bubble up in combat. Oh, okay. You know what? I, I, can, I can kind of like lop three rounds off of this thing yeah. by coming to this story point, reaching this conclusion rather than play, just continuing to play it out for another half an hour. I, th I think a lot of times I know when I was uh, started GMing and stuff like that and, and even recently it's you look at your encounter and you're like okay I have you know four guys and they all have 60 hit points or whatever and and in order to win they're gonna have to defeat these four guys in the 60 hit points and you start going through and you you go okay this is turning into a slog you know yeah. and this just I did not intend this to happen and the mindset is like well they have 60 hit points. Party's got to get through those 60 hit points right. or else, you know. But it's like no one knows but you <laughs> what, what's really growing, going on here. Right. You know, you can the, – the adjustment is entirely up to you and, and, and no one is going to fault you for, you know, going, okay, well, I've, you know, this guy's just got 40 hit points or these guys are, you know, they didn't pass their morale check. They're going to run right. away or whatever, you know. So, yeah, there's – and, and, and I think there's also nothing wrong with, even if you don't, if you decide not to fudge the numbers, right? Which, and, and I don't use fudge in this case pejoratively. Like right. if you decide to change, you know, the hit points are always arranged. We talked about this last week. But I think it's also 
entirely within your purview to go, well, these guys, these two guys, even though they also have as many hit points as the other dudes, these two guys are the two cowards of the right. patrol, right? right? The first two guys are the two guys who are gung ho. The one guy, gung ho. The one guy is a, is the, the the leader of the patrol. The other guy is gunning to try and get a you know a captain's position. And then these other two guys are just enlisted dudes who have to go on this thing mm-hmm. every single week or every single day or whatever it is. And they're not down for this. And so they kill the first two guys, and you know, and, and the last two guys go, ah, wait, no, yeah. <laughs> we're not. You know, it's it's fine for you to take that control over those characters and say not everybody's just because they're all statted the same doesn't mean they have the same attitude or that they f- or that they feel the same. Yeah. It's easy to like apply a cookie cutter and go, okay, well, he, just because he's the captain, he, you know, we're just using the same stats for all four of these guys. But if you put a little spin and a little nuance on it, yeah, this guy has 60 hit points because he's the grizzled veteran who's one day from retirement, and he's like, screw this. Mm-hmm. No, you know what? I give up. I Just like, take my sword. I'll, I'll tell you where the back entrance to the castle is. I just want to go home to my wife. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, I'm going to have Lars here punch me in the face a couple times, <laughs> and we're going to say that we barely escaped, and we won't tell who we got encountered. We'll just say it was bandits on the road. Just let us go. Right. You know? And that makes for an engaging and dynamic opportunity for your players to learn something and to to gain some rewards from their victory that are not related to gold and hit points or finding a journal of clues or whatever it is. Maybe instead of finding the map that has the back entrance of the capital, uh, to the castle, they, they just managed to beat enough of the guards that it's like, I'll tell you. Yeah. All right. I, I'm not happy about this, but guess what? You can tie me to a tree for, or whatever for the next. I'm not going to die for this king. Yeah, here. I'm not going to die. <laughs> that guy's an a hole. Yeah. Me. All right. So uh, that's our hour here. Yes, your your monsters can evolve. Sometimes your players just want a dungeon slog, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. But I think that what you know the, the real core issue that I've been wrestling with as we really get our D and D streaming game together is that some of the legacy mechanics of D and D don't make for interesting failures. This sure. isn't exactly like groundbreaking stuff. But you need to find ways to inject those interesting failures and those interesting wins into the game. Yeah. And then it's perfectly within your purview to do that. So some of it, you could watch the stream and go, well, why don't they just play Dungeon World? It's a good question. <clears throat> but, you know, I have a long history with D&D. I like 5th edition. And... Uh, it has huge brand recognition, right? It brings an audience. Mm -hmm. Um, And also it's something that people can relate to, right? How many people in our chat right now either are playing in a game, running a game, or wish that they were of of D&D specifically? I would argue, you know, most most everyone. Uh, So, you know, there are certainly other alternatives out there that we could pursue, but this is is what we've got. And I think it's, it's a great system. Let's find ways to make it work. Rather than going, well, I just you know, I, well, I just have to play something else. Right. And and I think the point of finding interesting in, interesting ways for the party to succeed is just as important as the mantra of find an interesting way for them to fail. So. Yeah, crit fail decks and crit success decks um, can add a little bit of bonus swinginess and excitement and. And extra. I mean, <clears throat> I think in general, whenever you roll a natural one, whenever you roll a natural twenty, that is an opportunity for you are given license within the game to break the rules of right. whatever's happening and to really intrude narratively on the game mechanics of what are playing out and say, actually, what happens is your sword flies out of your hand and lands right in front of the guard with the giant warhammer. I, I think those just real quick those decks can be really useful if you're if the players are having issues with the role playing and the descriptions of those types of things you know if you're if you're looking to help them expand their ability to describe their actions and stuff like that not not everyone needs to or, or wants to but 
it can help by giving them examples and say, oh, okay, just pull from the crit, you know, fail deck. Let's see what happens. And then they kind of get an idea. Oh, okay, this is something, this is crazy. All right, that sounds good. Um, it gives them an idea. But if you've got people that are already able to describe and you, you're giving them free reign, as Tom says, to kind of you know, do what they want to do with those things, then that's fine too. I think, you know, it, 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 it's it's a trick that that Matt Mercer deploys, you know, on a regular basis. Yeah. And sort of become famous for it. It's like, okay, well, how do you want to do this? Mm -hmm. You know, and and I think you can apply that question without using that framing to a variety of different situations, right? That you can say, you know, ask those leading questions of, okay, well, tell me what it is about this guy that makes you think that he's got a backroom deal going on with the mafia. Right. Okay. Well, that gives the players like some room, some license in the fiction to kind of go, oh, well, I happen to notice that he's got a tattoo on his neck of like, you know, a, of, of a king's crown um, that, is, you know, a, a gold piece that has a particular stamp on it. And I know that anybody who has that stamp has done prison time. And I know that, you know, the Neverwinter prison is notoriously infiltrated by the mafia. Oh, okay. Great. Now all of a sudden you get this whole piece of world building that you didn't have to do that was invented by that player that they're more invested in and then you can kind of make a note of and expand upon and integrate in and they're like, wow, he really took my suggestion and went with it. Mm -hmm. So, story agency for all. Mm -hmm. I agree. Oh man, it's back. we're back to dungeon time. Oh. 1337 is the most you can you can bet everyone. Keep that in mind. How much do you want to bet, Tom? What? You can't bet for me, can you? Not you, but I can. 1337. Okay. Max it out. Go big or go home. All right. Once this is Tom's bet. <laughs> Very good. Um, so there you go. I hope that 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 you know those are some high level ideas. I I think we'll see how some of them play out tomorrow night because we've got for sure one combat encounter kind of teed up mm -hmm. and then we'll see what happens. I really do, I like the idea that the Froggy Moth um, plays a role in this. I don't know that it's the traditional comes out of the lake and eats somebody kind of role. Sure, yeah. That's okay. Like, I think if we had a little more time, ideally that would be the way that it was. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that that it's not going to be just as iconic when they see this thing. Yeah, right, right. right. So um, that's 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 where we're at. I'm I'm curious to see. I, I I think for me going into this session, there's a lot of pressure of we've got a lot of things approaching, um, and we've got several things that are in the immediate category. And you know, on Thursday I held up my sort of like my 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 secrets board and I crossed off a bunch of stuff, right? But I've got a lot more things on the. We won. We won. See. Oh no. my God. Yes. Um, we've got a lot of things in the, in the hopper here that we need to push and build to over the next four sessions. And so for me, this next session, just like last session was, let's get a lot of information out, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think this session also has to be, let's get a lot of information out. Let's find a lot of our plot MacGuffins and whatnot, right? Um, and and uh, and and get those those wheels turning and get the, the things really churning towards a conclusion here or a climactic um, uh, uh, confrontation. Right. So, I, I, I we've had we've we've been lucky in terms of having a little bit of time to have some big like fight our way through the ship type of encounters, uh, especially like with the the subathon and whatnot. But I think now it's uh, now it's get get those get those chess pieces on the board so that our we can push to our last two sessions really being like fighting their way out of the ship and then encountering Xanathar, right? So yeah, I don't you know I don't know that the players do feel charged <laughs> uh, with driving uh, with the info that they've been given. I think I th I think unfortunately right now we're at a position where. They go someplace, they find something out, something happens, and um, then they're told, well, in order to fix that thing that happened, you need to go to this place. Yeah, they're and, sort of pinballing. Yeah, they're just sort of yeah, bouncing from, where do we find the God's Fire? We went into this place? No, we um, heard this scream of Avril's parents. 
we go to this pl we go and rescue Avril's parents. Oh, it turns out that they're under a curse and they're being, you know, they've had limbs cut off. Now we need to go to this place. Can we heal them? No, we can't. Now we need to go to this place. Mm -hmm. It's very they're doing they're sort of frog hopping from from plot little plot lily pad to plot lily pad and there's only one direction for them to hop to. So I think it feels a little linear and a little railroady. And I'd like to either give them some options or at least give them some um, some capabilities that give them an advantage. Now, we could maybe give them some more technology yeah. or something like that, uh, or dump even more information, just kind of like put it all out on the table and go, here's what's going on. Now that you've finally gotten to this point, you've unlocked the complete blueprints of the ship and who's where and what's what, what do you want to do? Um, we could have one of those kind of sessions. I think the other thing, too, is in retrospect, it's very easy as a DM to go, well, I don't want to, um, I don't want to include this thing because it seems a little too on the nose, right? Like, I think uh, at some point in one of the rooms, they're supposed to find some weed killer type of stuff in one mm. of the labs or something like that. Either they didn't get there or I, or I omitted it because I felt like, well, it's a little bit of, um, it's a little, it's a little too on the nose for them to find this. And I think if you give them those, 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 give them those things far enough in advance, they tend to kind of forget about them, or, or, or it doesn't have any possible. What you have to do is you have to create a possibility for it to be an ace in the hole for them, right? Right. <clears throat> so in other words, like, if they had been given some sort of, like, if they had been given that EMP bomb way back in session four or something like that, they would be sitting on that going, when's the right time to use it? And they might have, they might have, they might have been gone, this is our savior, blam, let's let, set it off. Yeah. Instead, they got it in the same session, they set it off in the same session, which was still fun and climactic, but, but I don't think there was, I think there was an opportunity to set up some things that might have paid off further down the road that I ignored or didn't, or chose not to include for whatever reason. And now, in hindsight, I'm like, God, it wouldn't it be great if they had some sort of like weed killer bomb that they could use against these plant guys? That would be fun. Mm -hmm. But they don't, and I can't just, you know, put one on the platform with them. Right, yeah. Um, so that's, that's one of those things where it's like, mm, I don't know what you... I don't know what you do about that. It's a natural GM inclination to go, eh, it's a little too on the nose. The, the flip side of it, too, is oftentimes players forget about that stuff. And so if you're relying on them to draw their ace in the hole, and then they don't do it, and you're like, well, you guys would have, I wouldn't have killed that guy, but you were supposed to use your big bomb, and they're like, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> then they feel stupid, and uh, right. uh, uh, <clears throat> Estelle Castillo says, have you considered plotting out less for the next chapter, letting them decide what they want to do from scratch? I've considered that, um, you know, the, the, the problem, I, I tried to let them do that last session, right? And the problem was, and, and, and honestly, like I was like prepared to answer basically any question that they posed, except of course for the one that they posed, which is where's the regenerator thing? <laughs> right, yeah. And that was the only question that they had, and they didn't have any other questions about the rest of the ship. Um, so I think that they don't have the tools to create a plan from scratch. They need much more information, and I was expecting them to extract that information and use it to their advantage, and I don't think that they're just got their minds around how they can proactively do that. So instead, I think I need to load them with information and let them choose how they want to go forward. But, you know, we'll see how that that plays out. Um, we can we can go for that, but it's 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 tricky. Um, oh, whatever the next se the next se season is, I'm not even like we're gonna take a short hiatus. I don't know how many like two or three weeks or something like that. Once the season finale happens, we're gonna take a short hiatus, and then I don't know what what happens on the other side of that, right? We've been talking about a number of different possibilities, mm -hmm. but um, I don't, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not, like I have, 
I'm going to take a break. Let's and, let's and, get through barrier let's, peaks. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's build to the let's build to the finale and see how that goes. Yeah. And then um, and then we have some time to like not only for me to reflect on like okay here's how this season went, but also to reflect with the players like okay how would you what you know what style of game do you want to pursue what seems like fun you know there's a whole there's a galaxy of ways that we could shake things up and change it right yeah um, and also like. I don't think it's unreasonable to consider that even though they're only level six or whatever, they've been playing these characters for the better part of a year or so, mm -hmm. right? So we could say this is the this was the campaign for this set of characters and and wrap that and put a bow on it. I don't know that that's what we'll do, but it's it's something to consider, right? Is even even though you consider a campaign to be like oh, we played all the way to 12th level or 14th level or whatever. If you feel like your characters have reached a, a heroic level of competence, that can be an opportunity to go, hey, you know what? I don't know how we top this. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, we are dropping frames like crazy, so it might be... Oh, the internet is bad to... for us. Yeah. All right, that's okay. My, my parking time is up as well. Okay. Uh, great. So you can tune in tonight for... The League of, of Adventure. Adventure. Yes. <clears throat> um, so that's coming up tonight at 8 o'clock Pacific. You can mm -hmm. tune in for that. Uh, tomorrow night, of course, is our game, so check in for that. Thursday afternoon, we're back here, probably, mm -hmm. uh, to talk about how everything went. So join us at 2 p.m. Pacific for that. Um, then Thursday night, we're dark. Friday is another uh, Wild Deadlands cards. Reloaded Wild Cards game. So get on board. It, are you still on the train? Get on board the train. Uh, we are off a train. Get off, get off, get off board the train. Yeah, get off board the get train. Get off board the train. Deboard the train. Detrain the board. Yes. Uh, and then Sunday, of course, is Tempting Fate. Yes? Uh, no. No. Uh, no. We are Please. doing a roll for shoes. Roll for shoes. Actually. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so. There you go. Uh, that is our uh, that's our calendar for the week. Thanks so much to everyone who tuned in, who uh, reshared us on social media, who's a Patreon backer. The end of the month is coming. It's a great time to sub up for our Patreon. I'll have some more handouts for you and whatnot in our um, in in our Patreon only backers folder. So uh, indulge in the Patreon if you are not indulged in the Patreon. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks so much to uh, Fakwad and and uh, all of our mods who do such a great job of keeping the channel safe, friendly, clean, and accessible. Uh, I'm Tom Lommel. This is Dom Zook. Until next time, let's dungeon. I mean, so. That was like a Thanos level of clicking. That was not a Galactus level of clicking. Well, that's because Galactus is a Celestial and not a Titan. He's way taller. He's way bigger than Thanos. <laughs>